and welcome to the 2020 Black Sustainability Summit. This is our fifth annual summit. Happening right now is our session, uh, H2O Water is Life. This is a panel with so many dynamic people from around the globe, uh, around the world that have been doing this work. We are so pleased and excited to have them with us today. We are going to be moving very swiftly and within our time frames to make sure that we have more than enough time and space for Q&A at the end. I have the pleasure of opening up with our sister Erica Holloman Hill, Dr. Erica Holloman Hill, based here in Atlanta with Aika Solutions. Um, she will be the moderator for today. We also have with us um, our brother BJ Bird and Baird and um, Lavanya Jones on tech support. And we are just excited to have all of our panelists here. I'm gonna turn it over to Erica, if you can click to the next slide. This is um, a very important topic, especially in this day and age, regarding what we know is fundamental to life on this planet. Um, as an earth system scientist, we understand that there's certain key things that are essential for life and water is one of them. And so very excited to introduce to you our panel. And I will like to introduce to you all our first speaker who will be Mr. Moses West. Mr. Moses West, is the founder and owner of AWG Contracting. He combines a very unique background as a prior member of the United States Armed Force, where he is an esteemed member of the 75th Ranger Regiment, the 2nd Armored Division, the 2nd Infantry Division, the 7th Cavalry Regiment, and the 101st Airborne Division. So together with this military experience um, has allowed Mr. West a unique appreciation for the value of water and has advanced his technical skills. He's currently developing new technology and methods of implementing this technology that he's developed to include social responsibility and most importantly, ownership of local water, food and energy production based around the science of centralized um, point specific water production, specifically from the atmosphere. So very um, excited to introduce to you all today, our first speaker, Mr. Moses West. Um. Hello everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here today and uh, thank you for inviting me. And um, I have a I have a message that is uh, is is definitely a, a message that we all need to hear today, as we continue to run out of water around the planet. Uh, if we look at where we are today and with our food, uh, we see that uh, we have food deserts all throughout the United States where we can't get organic fruits and vegetables, and mainly it's because we don't have a real a reliable source of water there as we used to in the past. All of our ancestors, we've always uh, lived around a source of water and that source of water was a clean source of water which made us healthy and was a clean source of water that allowed us to grow healthy food that we grew ourselves. Uh, in the age of uh, mass media and uh, fast food and, and, and advertisement, uh, we're, and no, having no time, we've gone to a place, and climate change, we've gone to a place where we've started to drink things that are not normal to our, our human body and foods that are not, that are contaminate the human body. Well, in the process of doing this company and starting my company, the one thing that I knew is there was three sources of water. Three sources of water exist on the earth in the form of a liquid, a solid, and a gas. It never changes. It's always that way. And we've always gone for the easy water. We've gone for the water that we find in our aquifers or flowing down a stream. And even sometimes in the ice, we can melt ice and we can drink that. That's how water was always, how we've always gotten it. We would dig a well. Well, with technology advances the humankind. That all that water travels around this earth from the surface to 10,000 feet and something that we call the troposphere. The troposphere holds all the moisture in there, all the moisture that travels everywhere. 
And when it comes down in a rainstorm or hurricane in Louisiana, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, it's all water that's trapped in the troposphere, evaporating out of the ocean and travels. That's the superhighway. Well, with technology, what we do is we can now borrow that water, a portion of that water to use it. We could actually borrow it in the billions of gallons and have absolutely no effect on the planet. Because as soon as we borrow that water, I drink a gallon of water, three hours from now, that gallon of water will not be back in, it will not be in me, but it'll be evaporating back up. It's the same, it's, it's, the, it's the cycle of water on this earth. The machines that I've built, there's one operating in Flint, Michigan right now. I've operated one in Puerto Rico. It removes water from the atmosphere at the same level of energy consumption that you remove water from the ground. And right now I've advanced the technology to the place where we operate the technology inside of a box, a 550 box or 20 foot ISO box. What we've done is I've added a second stage to this technology now where we can go into a place where there's absolutely no water, contaminated water, but humidity in the atmosphere. And we can build a structure, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 foot structure and make that entire structure generate water in the tens of thousands of gallons. And we do it all on sunlight. If you look at the mission that was done in Puerto Rico on the island of uh, Vieques at the hospital Susana Centeno, the system arrived there um, right after Hurricane Maria hit and there was a Tesla battery on the other side of the building. And my equipment, the water generator was on the opposite side of the hospital. We pulled the, we ordered a cable from the United States. We plugged into the Tesla solar array and the battery backup, and we ran water making, turning sunlight into electrons, uh, into H2O molecules. We, we made enough water for 5,000 people daily off of sunlight. We ran on solar power. That was it the first time net zero had ever been done on a large scale with an atmospheric water generator. And right now today, this is the end of the season for, for Flint, Michigan, but we have an, a machine operating in Flint, Michigan in the fourth ward, supplying the residents with free water, free water off of donations to the Moses West Foundation and, and money from my company and, and other donors in Flint and it's supplying them water, pulling it from the atmosphere. Um, I have, there's, there's several documents that I have that you all will be very interested in. And I probably don't, won't, won't get to them here, but uh, there's, uh, there's water quality reports. And uh, here's, here's, what, uh, here's what one of the machines looks like. This is one of the small machines, but I, I've redesigned, I'm building machines right now uh, for the federal government. And every time I build a machine, I completely redesign the, redesign the machine. I make it bigger, better, and badder. It's like building a hot rod for me. So Can you share the screen. I will. Oh, well, here we go. Let me see if I get this. Uh, this is a this is one of the machines, and this is what it looks like. And uh, this is a machine that you go roll around. This machine right here supplies enough water for in a day for 500 people for drinking, and you can move that machine around. Here's some of the inner workings of the machine. All of this is a uh, proprietary information. It's all the, this is this is all uh, of what I've designed over the years, and um, this system here is unique to uh, more unique to anything in the world today in the way that it operates. Okay, and then let's see here. Oh, one second here. Let me go back and then go back one more. Sorry, guys. Um, person Twitter. Here we go. And something I want to share with you here. here here's, what, here's what the machine looks like. This is what it looks like. This is the uh, this is a current military model, and that's it. There finished out, 
But here's what I think is most important to everybody here today. Uh, the, the next generation moving up with the technology. If you look at this drawing here, this says 20 feet. This is 20 feet wide, 20 feet tall, and it's 40 feet long. In this center section here, that's water. This whole top section here is what pulls moisture out of the air. This is completely doable right now as this is the next level of this technology. And currently I'm, I am the only person right now who is doing it at this, at this level. And then we shall see here. Um, here. These water buffaloes here that you see on the large machine, each one of those water buffaloes holds 400 gallons of water, 400 gallons of water. And it took about three days to fill all those up. So each one of those water buffaloes could roll out, you could fill up more and go out. So each one of those water buffaloes is actually a village that you could be providing water to. Here's one of the vehicles that we use to pull the water buffaloes around. We're stationed at the military base for a long time, and um, they, they uh, actually use the water quite a bit. So let's see, let's see if I will see a picture of the larger system. Yeah. So Mr. Moses, this is um, Erica and uh, the technology is amazing and it has me thinking um, in the various ways that it addresses and provides security when we talk food insecurity in places where you don't have access to water. Yes. Um, even in the urban context and the work that I do, we're at a city park, but we've been trying for the last two years to get access to the city meter and um, have been collecting rainwater. So the various ways in which the equipment can be deployed is just really amazing. Um, you said some things and some words that I wanted to kind of give all of our participants some grounding. You said some things like net zero and yeah. Um, energy consumption and the amount of energy consumed versus the amount of energy produced. And all of those are very important concepts that are pertinent to this conversation around water, but also to a broader conversation around energy burden and what that means for our communities across the globe. So if you don't mind also kind of explaining a little bit about what net zero is and what that means in the context of renewable energy and water? Yes, I will. The um, net zero, when, you, um, when you're not taking any power from the grid and you're using sunlight to produce your power or wind or wave or renewable energy to produce the power that you need to produce the water that you need. One thing about this technology is you can't have this technology and you can't have it where it's so energy intensive, where other companies in the world that build this or other people who've tried it, the energy consumption is much too high. And so it's not very feasible because it's too expensive to do it. You might as well bottle water and truck it from a hundred miles. What I've concentrated on is I've concentrated on lowering that energy consumption and that's that's been my main focus, lower the energy consumption and raise the water out the water output. So now we have the technology at a place when we speak net zero, you can produce the solar power stored in batteries, produce the water, produce enough water for drinking, for bathing, for and for hydroponic food operation. So basically right now we have, I have the capability, we have the capability, all of us have the capability joining together to get this done. Whereas you do not need, a, you do not need to connect to the power grid or you do not need to connect to a city pipe for your water. Today here in Texas, this is cooler today, but the humidity is extremely high. 
uh, by myself, I stopped counting in uh, 2018, but I've made over a million gallons of water, a million gallons of water by myself. And when I deployed to Puerto Rico, I supplied 5,000 people with drinking water for months. And I did it by myself. And then when I went to Flint, Michigan, I did it with uh, Latoya Ruby Fraser and the Rauschenberg Foundation. They donated the money that was required to move the unit to Flint, Michigan. And then the, uh, the residents of the neighborhood, when that machine that you see in the picture there, that's Otis at the machine. And that was a daily event. Uh, they took ownership of it. The, the machine was put on a private piece of property. Uh, we had to run it on diesel generator because the, the disenfranchised neighborhoods, you have to remember, they, they remove all of the high, ten, the high power lines, industrial power, 460 volt, three phase power. You don't find that in inner city neighborhoods because that brings, that's power that industry can use. If you don't have enough power for industry, industry will not come to that neighborhood. For me to remove to move that kind of power to that neighborhood, it's in the area of anywhere between fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars just to run that type of power line through to to run the generator. Now I say the generator runs on on four hundred and sixty volts, but it does not use all four hundred and sixty volts. It just uses what it needs. But with this technology. To set, it in, to set it in the areas where it sits in Flint. So you see them operate the machine here in Flint. If I use some of that water and next door to that, I grew hydroponic fruits and vegetables that, that eliminates a food desert in that, in that neighborhood. So they have water, which is pure or clean, which, which keeps them healthy. And then they also have fruits and vegetables that they can grow, which also keep them healthy, healthy because there's no stores in the neighborhood that sell fruits and vegetables. So this whole, this whole system put together as a package could be set down throughout the United States through that there's a range where we have, say from about uh, Kansas going all the way over to North Carolina, all the way across the midsection of the United States and South, where the, where the temperature line has grown up, gone so far up that it doesn't grow below 45 degrees Celsius uh, more of the year, uh, much of the year anymore because of the rise in temperatures. And now all these areas, they have, not only do they have contamination issues with water, contamination issues with food, but what we have is we have an abundance of water in the air that we can pull out cheaper than we can remove it from the ground. Thank you, thank you. Hello, um, yeah, this is very fascinating. I'm sorry I got on a little late. Oh, is it, can I ask a question or, or not? Not yes. yet, not, not yet. It's not, it's not time right. to ask yet. We're gonna get through each one of the prisons each one of the panelists, and then we're gonna oh, open up for all of them to speak. Thank you. And so the, um, so the technology that I have, it's, a, it's an answer to a problem that, that is, is going to plague us for years. But instead of um, panicking for water, I, I see people sitting around, we have people sitting in Georgia at Alabama right now, the hurricanes have come through and everyone is sitting and they're saying, we need someone to bring us bottled water. It's 90 degrees and it's 98% humidity. If I took a machine down there, I'd be making 5,000 liters, 2,000 gallons of water a day, pure water to give to them. The water quality tests have been done by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, the Food and Drug Administration, the United States military, and we have aced these things because I, the war, amount of work that I've put into the machine to design them, uh, there's, there's no bacterial, no bacterial growth, and the machines they put out an extremely pure level of water at, at a low energy consumption. So we have water everywhere for us to use. There's no water shortage. That's a great segue, uh, Mr. Moses, just so that we can stay on time um, and we have a dynamic panel. So 
the next panelist up for this dynamic um, speaker is going to talk about Chicago's water solutions. Um, this is very exciting to me. Um, I work for one of the clients that I work for is the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, and they work on this national program called SPARK. And once I started asking around the Chicago table, um, I just knew that certain folks that do this work on the ground were not at this table. So as we talk about access, um, equity in water, I look forward to really hearing what Chicago is doing. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you two dynamic women in this game. First, Dr. Fia Zakia, who is a political scientist with research interest in environmental policy, politics, and agroecology, with a recent focus on water, on the water justice movement, affordability, which we know is a crisis, as well as Black land sovereignty issues, using an African-centered worldview. Uh, she is a current Fulbright uh, specialist scholar until September 2020, she was a senior fellow water infrastructure for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Um, very excited to hear from her and have her share her wisdom. Also sharing this panel with her is Miss Naomi Davis. Miss Naomi Davis is the founder and president of Big which is Black and Greens, a nonprofit uh, born to harness the new green economy opportunities that are um, here to rebuild the bygone uh, commune economy of her childhood. Big tackles the twin crisis of pollution and poverty by activating Black neighbors as walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, walk to play, places where neighbor dollars circulate to fertilize self-interest. Um, so together, without further ado, I would love for uh, Dr. Zakia and Ms. Davis to go ahead and um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holman Hill. And don't you dare act like you don't know me because I will come for you. I, I didn't know how familiar we could get in the uh, space, well, but it is familiar. so good this to is, see you. Yes. We're going to be family up in here because we are. And you know, I just love and adore you and your family and the work that you're doing, your mom, your babies. You are an amazing Black woman. And uh, of course, um, um, Afia Reina, I, you know, she's family too. She is the genius behind this work. And um, I'm just feeling so encouraged by uh, the presentation by Moses West just now, just feeling like, yes, we can, we can sort of thrive. Uh, I wanna give you some solar so that you can <laughs> keep generator down. And uh, we, have a, we have an off-grid uh, affordable housing property that we're developing here and we want your water mechanisms. And so this is the kind of synergy that we just thank uh, Black Sustainability Summit for, that we are being connected and being cross-fertilized. And of course, my good friend, uh, an internationally renowned water policy expert, Dr. Afia Sakia, um, is, um, is family too. She works very closely with the Black Chicago Water Council. And we're gonna talk to you today about the structure and the system for the work that we do in community organizing around water. Uh, we're gonna invite you across the country, wherever you are, to uh, you know, dial in with us on first Tuesdays to uh, enjoy uh, what it means to uh, connect neighbors with subject matter experts uh, for community driven solutions um, on the ground that uh, solve the matters of burning concern in the black community. So I'm going to uh, screen share, but I first wanna give my uh, beloved uh, Dr. Zakia a, a note to just say hello before we drill in. Dr. Zakia. 
Okay, thanks so much, uh, Mama Naomi. Um, very glad to be here uh, with you. And actually, this is my first appearance at the Black Sustainability Summit, at least in terms of actually saying something. Um, I've, I've definitely supported uh, Sister uh, Afia um, over the years with um, uh, doing this, uh, you know, building this platform. So I'm very excited to, to be here and support her. Of course, you know, um, we are, have started a journey together to uh, save, you know, <laughs> the world and all black folk to make sure that we have um, the right to water, safe, affordable, clean water, sanitation, uh, and during this uh, time of pandemic, I think everybody realizes uh, more than ever the importance of this work. So I'm just glad to support you and, you know, uh, all of my friends, sisters and brothers in Chicago. I know quite a few people there. So we, you know, they, they need their water and stuff like that. So thank you so much for your vision that you have had in creating this um, Black Chicago Water Council I think it's a model if we, you know, as we discuss tonight, um, that should be uh, replicated across the US. And, and we've been talking about some, you know, from Pan-African perspective, uh, linking with our brothers and sisters in Africa and connecting the work that I've been doing there with uh, a network of people who I know to just make sure that of course, as you said, um, community, uh, black community solutions for black global problems uh, towards achieving uh, water, land, food, energy, sovereignty. So oh, that's my opening <laughs> spiel. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And I am going to uh, go ahead and share screen now um, and, um, and, and just kind of walk through what it is that we've done and how we expect we'll be able to reach out to you and um, and really, uh, frankly, understanding that here in the arc between Emmett Till and George Floyd, we don't have anything like the dream of our ancestors. Um, the sacrifices that they made and the plans that they that they laced. Um, we need to, in our generation, uh, in this time, uh, come together, uh, and we're calling for a national conversation um, for not only a water bill of rights but a utility bill of rights. And I'm going to walk you through what we're uh, what we're talking about and. Um, you give me just a minute to get my screen together. We'll jump right in. Um, let's see. The idea was accelerated at the time that we uh, realized in the pandemic that although our mayor uh, Lightfoot had declared a moratorium on water shutoffs, that uh, there were untold tens of thousands who were actually already living without water. And the idea that we could be um, not only tolerating that, um, I mean, we didn't, most of us, you know, we're about our busy days and lives. We're not necessarily, necessarily focused on that aspect um, at any given moment, but it became like a stark reality something we couldn't ignore, and so something that we set about uh, doing something about. And um, in, uh, in, the, in, in the idea of making change, we created a, a, um, a, a system for uh, organizing our neighbors. And so what we have basically identified is a monthly, uh, program and here's an example of some of the things that we talk about in our monthly programs, how we're going to take back our power, 
um, best practices. We, we, we want to make sure we're not just complaining, but that we actually have models. Um, and many of you don't know, why would you know this? But there is a really remarkable system of water management at the municipal level in Cincinnati, run by what? A sister, okay? A sister is running that water system and really innovating in ways that uh, Chicago uh, is just in the Stone Age, but we're going to be uh, we're going to be taking up that uh, taking up that mantle. We want to make sure that people understand, and there are many of us here in the Midwest who are uh, or at the, at the coasts who are experiencing catastrophic uh, sea level rise or uh, or shoreline erosion, and it's hitting us hard. It's taking out our neighbor's property. You've lived all of your life. You've invested everything you have. And now uh, Lake Michigan is taking your home away. And you'll see some pictures about that. So we're inviting people in a very structured way to come and join us. The way we like to think about it is again, as family. We like to say that we're neighbors, helping neighbors help neighbors. We are very, very community centric. Um, there is the, 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 the too high burden of the cost of water, electricity, gas, um, internet. And uh, we are helping our, our neighbors move through uh, the maze of the applications, the eligibility. Uh, we recognize and experts, other experts have declared that 6% of your household for electricity and gas is really at the top edge of what you should be allocating from your household income for uh, light and heat. And another maybe two, two and a half percent, uh, Dr. Zakia is, uh, as I said, an, an expert uh, in, in water policy and understanding water as a human right. And that, and, and that actually there are some people who can and should just have their water for free if that, uh, if that is, um, if that is the if that is the case, and, and she can talk a little bit more about the models associated with that. So this is where we started off again. The top of the year, we had we had thousands of these flyers printed, and we distributed them, um, you know, on foot by car. Uh, at the time that COVID was hitting, we noticed a statistical correlation between the highest incidences of COVID and where water was shut off. And so we began targeting those neighborhoods with the highest um, uh, rates of, of both of those first. But interestingly, what, you, what we came to understand is the extreme dysfunction. And of course, every municipality is a little bit different and um, some are winning and some are losing. But in Chicago, I don't know that there's anyone that's worse than Chicago as a municipal led entity. We have one section that does um, the delivery of the water, another department that does the billing for the water, and a third department uh, for third party collections. And so when it came down time for many of us in coalition to press the city of Chicago to get the data for who was shut off so that we could in coalition um, um, co convene and work solutions out and reach out and raise money and, and, um, in, and, and involve ourselves in the system change, um, the city of Chicago could not answer the questions. They had no idea how many households had been shut off. We, uh, we, they didn't know who was still off, who had been shut back on either by themselves or by, um, you know, by self-help as we know it in the hood or, um, or what the conditions of the plumbing uh, units were in, um, in, in, the, in those households. And now we're embarking on a very, very uh, badly needed lead service line replacement program, which if every household affected, hundreds of thousands of households affected were being treated in a progressive, fair and equal way, we would spend $8.25 billion in those service line replacements. Instead, uh, City of Chicago Pilot is gonna do 600 homes. They're gonna do a few here and a few there. They're gonna make it on a voluntary basis. They're going to allow the City Department of Water, uh, which is, uh, is, has, is, is a legendary race-hating organization. I'm not 
you know, people know I, you know, I, I'm guilty of hyperbole from time to time, but this is not that. This is, this is court action. These are sanctions. These are heads rolling, race, documented race hatred in a water utility. And so the fact that they are considering putting CDBG dollars to run the lead service line replacement out of that department is an outrage. We've got to get, and of course, there's a brother at the head of the Chicago Water Department, Randy Connor. Let me call his name because we can't expect because someone has the skin color that they have the mindset and we cannot settle for that kind of tokenism. So we're, um, so we began a process of looking at how do we contextualize our work? And this is a work by Dr. Zakia, uh, where she started us off. And by the way, every Saturday, we have a uh, water shut on from 12 to two, um, uh, where we distribute water. And what we do is we talk to people about water as a human right. It's not like the normal average everyday conversation that folks are having on the street. And sometimes when we bring it up, it's like, yeah, of course it's a human right. Well, no, not really recognized that way in Chicago and in most of uh, the cities in the United States. Otherwise we would have different results. So what we do is in our process, we have everybody sign in and of course it's voluntary, but we frame it in the context of a petition because if we have to go to city hall and we have to have an aggregate of names and if we have to bring some bodies with us, we're going to do that. And this is just kind of organizing 101 that we're gonna accomplish a few things at the same time. Um, let me delete this because yeah. So uh, what we know is um, in addition to uh, the actual um, over expenditure uh, by uh, black and brown households on water, we are also uh, experiencing bias in the, uh, in the installation of water meters. And um, of course you can't manage what you don't measure. And what we have is a, a preponderance of of African-American homes who are non-metered. And that means um, astoundingly bad results from time to time. Well, on the regular, I'll put it this way. One of our members um, rolled up on, a, you know, over a decade of harassment by the water department, a $24,000 water bill, even though her water had been cut off for, you know, 14 years. And just really the hopelessness of dealing with um, a de water departments who are craven amoral and uh, absolutely incompetent. Can you tell I have an opinion about it? So, um, so, what we, so what we have established is a team of people, of neighbors, we, we have some experts. Every Saturday we have a training session, a working group, and we're digging down into the granular pieces. It's very, it's a labyrinth of, if you, if you make this much, you can do that. I mean, the LIHEAP programs are one thing, but to be able to say, um, as the city of Chicago recently said in a, in a statement, after shutting off 16,000 more homes, they just shut off, and this is just at, uh, be between the, the early part and the end of September, we don't have the records for the October shutoffs yet, but 16,000 more homes in uh, electricity, we have, uh, and of course we're bundling these because if you're having problems with your water bill, you're probably having problems with your electricity bill. You're probably having water with your, uh, problems with your heating bill. And of course the digital divide is old news, but we're, we're trying to put people together to solve uh, that cluster of problems at the same time. And so as a result, we have now uh, come out, uh, we're launching our first um, sort of policy-based campaign. The first campaign about, getting your water shut on was really emergency aid. And I wanna say out of one point, one three billion billion of federal emergency aid, which the city of Chicago got not a single penny was spent on shutting anybody's water on. And we meet every week on the regular, folks of us in who are in coalition to try to drive, it's like you know swimming in molasses. Uh, but I'll tell you this, we will not give up and we will prevail. So this is the kind of document that we're printing and sharing um, in, um, in partnership across the, um, it, across the city. Um, um, 
that relate to how the, the same strategy we're using for electric and gas, we're using for water, that we're going into the regulations, we're going into the programs, uh, we're going into the agencies and we're distilling in a very, very bulleted sort of condensed way of how people can get their utilities shut back on, whether again, it's, it's water, um, gas or electric. Uh, this is our, our, our water program. Uh, same level of detail and granular instructions that we're distilling for heat and water, heat and light we're, we're doing for our water. So, um, we, so, so I started off by talking a, a little bit about the structure of the Black Chicago Water Council. Dr. Zaki is working on Black Jackson Water Council. We encourage you to think about what could a, uh, the Water Council for your community be? How can we support you, whether it's organization-wise, financially, or otherwise, in organizing your um, your constituents to have voice. Um, this is just one of our monthly programs. This was September, um, this was um, uh, August. Um, and, and then I'm gonna show you uh, the results of, of, this, uh, of this August program has played out in a solution that uh, we're, we're very proud to report of neighbors leading the solution. This is very important. This is our director of natural resources, the state of Illinois. Out of this program, um, she sent 10 staff members down to the South Lakefront to meet with the community group that we were supporting and ended up writing a grant together uh, for some emergency relief because the kinds of damage that you, oh, I don't have that slide next, but I, uh, I wanted to um, share with you, well, I'll have to, it's a little bit out of sequence, but I wanted to share with you. So we are undertaking a utility bill of rights um, and invite you to come uh, join with us in this again as a national conversation. Many people do not understand that the idea of free and full access to uh, the commons is a very fundamental part of American history, uh, indigenous, uh, involved uh, uh, operations, the way that we have evolved into the pr privatization of things is not normal, it's not healthy, and it's not, especially not good for black people. So we're in the process right now of writing a utility bill of rights, because guess what? When everybody started working remotely and everybody was going to school from home, Guess who couldn't work as, as effectively? And guess who couldn't learn as effectively? Black people, because we don't have internet at the same uh, scale. We don't have technology in our homes at the same scale. And everybody knew this. And let's not act surprised now that the, you know, that the, um, you, you know what hit the fan. So what we're saying is that, and this is, this is an example of the program of our justice action group. So Black Chicago Water Council is divided into uh, several, uh, into eight greetings, action groups. Greetings, greetings, Sister Naomi. This is Sister Raina. I, you are hey. so passionate. It's so good to see you on here. Uh, I, I just want us to make sure we're mindful of the time. Uh, we're going to have to get, we're going to have to um, move to the, the next panelist. I hate to, to stop well, you here. Well, I, it's, it's I so hate good. to be I hate to be having to have you reprimand me because I just overspoke myself. But I'm going to I'm going to take I'm going to take the uh, the correction and I'm going to step away with these last words. This is part of what the lakefront damage is providing in our neighborhoods right now. That uh, we that neighbors are now working together with the, the with the state department to uh, correct. So um, there you have it and. Um, more pictures of our work together in water distribution. And thank you so much for being a part of our lives and um, more coming. Bless you. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mr. William Rinalis, also known as Billy to his friends. Um, Billy is an embodiment of what a cannabis expert and consultant should be. He has experience in the cannabis markets of the Caribbean, the United States, and Canada. 
He was born and raised on the island of Jamaica and has an intimate knowledge of agriculture and horticulture from an early age. Billy was one of the partners in one of the first front loader waste removal companies on um, the island, which became huge success uh, company. And he would also tell people that he was the mighty garbage man because he lived and slept garbage, which is, you know, here in the U.S. where we are socialized to be consumers, we create a lot of waste. So learning how to manage that becomes so important. Um, he is also the LATAM Director for International Commodities Management Consultants, Director of Aquatic Solutions and Innovations, and Vice President of Business Development for a number of projects with the EOP Foundation, Medicinal Cannabinoid Research and Policy Institute. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Billy, if I may call you my friend. I would hope so, my sister, Erica. Um, you know, I, if you can, that, that bio or that profile, you know, covers some of the many hats that I wear. Um, for this particular panel, it's actually something that is very near and dear to me because um, out of my business in waste management, it actually got me to get trained in wastewater treatment, um, wastewater um, treatment plant design. And I, we have another company that we had started that's called Aquatic Solutions and Innovations. And um, we are primarily the service provider for the municipalities. So we build sewage plants, we expand sewage plants. Um, we have, uh, we are the agents for patented technology um, for a company called Ecofluids, um, which is very ideal for, um, you know, industrial wastewater, um, for, for, you know, communities. It's a biological package wastewater treatment plant. Um, you know, we have very small footprints, you know, so for the sister that mentioned, um, housing developments, um, we are actually in Jamaica, the choice of plant for developers sometimes, especially when the consideration is for small footprints. Um, but we have a lot of things that I'm going to touch on. Um, some of what the brother before also touched on, um, you know, atmospheric water generation, which is something that we also offer um, from another company that is very closely affiliated with us. Um, but I will touch on that later. But, you know, this panel of water, you know, the island of Jamaica is called Jamaica, was given the name Jamaica, Jamaica by the Tainos, you know, it was called Jamaica, which meant the land of wood and water. And one of the things Jamaica has been blessed with is a lot of water. So, um, you know, most water is controlled in Jamaica, technically by the government, by the National Water Resources Authority, which then is mandates the National Water Commission to supply water to all of our and sewerage services to all of our um, our 2.7 million inhabitants. So you know Jamaica has, like I said, we have a lot of water. We have there's probably about an um, a portable network or portable water network of about 160 underground wells. Um, you know, there's water fed from about 116 river sources, which are treated via water treatment plants, and over 147, 148 springs, which um, are all over the island. They're managed by the National Water Commission <clears throat> in sometimes collaboration with about two or three private water companies that are there. But about 30% of the water that is taken um, or abstracted from Jamaica is used 
to to meet all of our portable water demand um and about the same the remaining 70 percent is is what goes to irrigation so that is also controlled irrigation is also controlled by a government agency called the national water commission um national irrigation commission sorry um but like i said the the island of jamaica is supplied by quite a, a network of water pipelines and that go to everybody's houses I and mean, the government jamaica had said that their goal was that every jamaican should have portable water supply by the year 2025 um, i'm not so sure how close they are to to to, to getting there um, because water the national water commission tends to be demand driven so based on the amount of revenue that they can collect from various areas would determine, um, you know, the, the pace at which they even bother, or even if they bother to, to install um, a lot of the water lines, and especially sewage. I mean, the government had made a, a promise or uh, it set a goal that all the major towns would have sewage supply systems in place by um, 2020. Well, I know that that's definitely not on 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 track but primarily i think we in jamaica sometimes get um we we don't realize how valuable our water resource is um and it's affected by some of the mining issues that we have had on the island but our water is so valuable that ships that come here you know the cruise ship industry is very large but it's, you know, ships come here one of the primary reasons besides our beaches and lovely um, vistas is water um, because Jamaica has clean portable water. Um, I think many Jamaicans can still drink water from the tap and even visitors can still drink water from the tap without risk of getting sick or, or um, you know, any sort of ailment or, or you know, illness would come about because our water is very key uh, um the the issue of water all across the world and, and i and as i hear you guys in the, in the u.s speak about it um and access to clean water is a right that everybody should have um you know we, we fight about that the water and the access to water is controlled by the government sometimes but you know at the end of the day you know we give thanks that we actually have access and there's a process by which you can if you have water on your land or in various places that you can actually um, apply to the government to get it done um, that you can extract that water for yourself um, in coming years with, with this new climate change um, you know we have challenges in jamaica with droughts which again causes its own problems with our water supply because again most of the major areas um, of water that we take are from like in Kingston or um, is from a dam and when water the, the, the surface water no rain happens those dam resources get lower no does that mean that we have no other water we have lots of water underneath the, the ground which comes up in in a lot of our wells and artisanal um, aquifers but the problem with a lot of it is that it is contaminated with nitrates. Like in Kingston and St. Andrew, we have a lot of water that sits right underneath the Ligony Plains. Um, but we can't use it for drinking purposes. It's mainly for irrigation because of the nitrate levels. And why, how did that happen? Because again, our choice of how we dispose of sewage, um, you know, a lot of householders in the past and before there was actually a structured sewage system, you do things like soak away pits um, which were traditionally used and are still used all in many places um, tile fields for, for other other places but this this water or this wastewater percolates into the ground and you know and, and at the end contaminates some of these aquifers so uh you know so that in the end the national water commission has also stopped um the allowance of building of those soak away pits and where this is where plants like what I build and what we supply come into play um, for 
municipalities, for communities, for housing developments, um, in order to treat their sewage properly so that you can discharge. What, you know, the funny thing is we start with water and we end with water, we just dirty it up in between. So the same volume that you start with is the same volume give or take that you have at the end. And it's now dirty, so we have to find um, better methods of cleaning. Um, the brother spoke earlier about, you know, access to drinking water and, and how available it is right it, uh, um, all around us. And that is something that, you know, we talk about, you know, atmospheric water generation. Um, and it's, a, it's not new technology. We actually, the company that we are affiliated with, I think we're actually one of the first ones that had patents on it. I think the patents are now up, so there's a lot more people who are going to be using it. Um, but we have a, a proven method to produce drinking water. Um, we have used it in many cases, many times, in many places in the world, Italy and Venezuela. Um, after Hurricane Ivan, we actually supplied it. Um, our offices are use them for drinking water. We don't buy bottled water. Uh, we can use we, our machines can also make them in um, if you want it alkaline or not. Um, if I could share my screen, I could show you what some of our um, what our unit looks like. Yes, and thank you, Billy. As you get ready to share your screen, I just would like for you to be aware of the time so that we can. Get so into I'm doing to move quickly. But some of what we have, you know, that we offer right now to the, because one of, we actually started from a different perspective where not only is water needed, but, you know, bottled water is a problem and bottled water creates bottles that um, pose issues for waste management and for issues with municipalities. But we have quite a few units that we have that can generate from you know, 100 gallons to 1,000 gallons. We have a, a military unit, we have emergency units that we have, that we supply. Um, they're made in the US. And they are similar technologies to what the brother was speaking about earlier. So it is, it's, it's, it's atmospheric, so this is a unit that we use inside of a house um, that, and it can all be used using renewable technology. So you can, you can power it using solar. It takes about nine kilowatts um, to use some of these to, to run most of some of them, um, the larger units. But there are like, see the 100 or 100 units uses two kilowatts per hour. Now, that, that produces up to 70 liters in a whole day. Um, that's more than, than your household will drink uh, in most cases. But a lot of these things can be modified and can be used for other applications. The technology is not necessarily um, new technology. We all have, I guess, various models or, or ways of applying it. But I give thanks for being part of this esteemed panel and these, all these members of, of this organization and friends from all around. Um, I think water is something that we are going to have to be more aware of. I mean, my perspective has always been from the clean side. So we try to help as development happens, you know, to, to help to make sure that we can be the solution for your clean water. I thank you. No, thank you. So Mr. Robertson is the founder and CEO of Biomedverse LLC, an early stage startup that focuses on creating custom biotechnology software and conducting research and development in the field of genomics, um, immunology, biostatistics, epidemiology, and environmental health. He is also a PhD student studying and conducting research in biomedical engineering at the State University of New York at Binghamton. Um, Daryl will be speaking about how silver nanoparticles and dissolved oxygen removes bacteria from water.
today. I'm really, really excited to introduce to you all Mr. Uh, Robertson and thank you so much. Okay, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I will try to be quick. You're right. a scientist. Yes, I, I know, I know, I know. Okay, uh, can everybody see my screen? Is that a yay or a nay or? Yes, yes. Okay, hey. awesome, awesome. Great, great, great. Okay, Um. so yes, yeah, this is a presentation regarding silver nanoparticle zeolites and dissolved oxygen, removing bacteria from uh, contaminated water. Um, so our goal was basically um, try to find a role um, or try to determine whether our silver nanoparticles um, is able to remove the bacteria more or if it's the dissolved oxygen or if it's really a tandem effort. And we want to be able to do this with Yes. Yes. Darrell, excuse me, please uh, put it in present mode. Oh, okay. Or whoever okay. is. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it was me. Uh, let me see. When you were back in there, it's the upper right-hand corner. Right, right. Oh, okay. For the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm trying to do that. Um, it says, yeah, wolva.com is sharing the screen. Oh, oh, wait, sorry. Is that the video? What is going on? Okay. Okay, I think everybody... Yeah, it says I'm sharing the screen. You go back to your part. Um, yeah, technical difficulty. Well, I'll just keep keep talking until that gets worked over. I was going to say, you might um, want to stop sharing your screen and then reshare it and allow right. you to pick the proper screen. Right. Okay. All right. Um, I guess I'm trying. Can everybody see the presentation now? Boy. No, I'm guessing no, see you. Okay, all right. Um, well, I'll just never mind for sit for time's sake. Um, we will. I'll just. Uh, I'll just talk. Um, but yeah. Um, so with the with the World Health Organization, um, uh, with most with Mr. Moses West, what he was saying, um, there is a standard for water purification and water treatment around the world. Um, three log. Um, reduction. So being able to eliminate 99.9% .9 of bacteria is a very, very important thing. Um, some companies report this, some don't. Um, but particularly with us, um, we're working with silver because silver has a lot of um, antibacterial, antiviral properties. Um, silver, for example, silver nitrate is used in a lot of top topical ointments um, and wound dressings. So we wanted to really use silver and to see if we could use silver nanoparticles um, to cure water. Um, but basically from our studies, we found that the bacteria is actually very, very intelligent and they could actually fight off the silver um, and not allow the silver to work and to remove the bacteria from water. So we, tr so we tried to combine, combine the silver with zeolites. Zeolites are aluminum silicate material, very porous, and they have an ion exchange capability. Um, so what we basically did is we fired on the silver nanoparticles, or we also painted it with the brush, painted the silver onto the nanoparticles, and we put it into the water in order to try and remove the bacteria. Um, however, we also we also found out that dissolved oxygen is something that's very very important um, in preserving light, um, preserving life, whether it's for fishes, um, microorganisms, or anything else. So, if we could raise the dissolved oxygen or even lower it, or basically make it uncomfortable for the bacteria, um, that could allow the silver nanoparticles along with zeolites to do its job, um, and ultimately. We, I would show you pictures, but we're having technical difficulties. Um, but ultimately, we were able to remove two log reduction. So we were able to remove 99% um, of the bacteria. Um, and the company that we're working with, Triton Ceramics, they have a patented um, filter technology that has been tested in other countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Nepal as well. Um, and the silver nanoparticles, are heat resistant, so they're able to withstand 1,150 degrees Fahrenheit, so very, very hot. Um, they're also very, very reusable um, as well. Um, unfortunately, some of the, I guess, some of the problems that we ran into um, in particular 
um, was that the filter sort of got clogged um, in some cases um, as well. And then we also had to figure out ways to uh, adapt and manipulate the filter um, in order to achieve the best performance um, as well. But ultimately, we're, we were able to remove um, quite a bit of bacteria as well as any odor um, from the water um, as well um, also. And I think as far as time, I think I will end it there. Um, and uh, I'll pass it back to Dr. Hill uh, and the rest of the, uh, the cast. Thank you so much for having us. So one of the things we'll make sure we try to do, um, Daryl, is see if we can put your presentation um, with the session so that folks can sure. have access to it. I know too, it has sure. a wealth of information sure. Um, sure. that people would be interested in. And so we have less than five minutes, and I'd like to take one question from the audience that have been placed here in the text chat. So when you think about, and some of the speakers have already been replying, but two questions came into the text. The cost, how much would one of the atmospheric water collection units cost? And are they available for commercial purchase and market? And to all of you all, when we think about the importance of water, I'd like for each of you all to just take a minute having this platform to use to let us know what is the most important thing you want to Excuse me. We're breaking up, today. sorry. Yeah, we're breaking up here. Um, Erica, so yeah, your sound is breaking up. And I really want to be um, fair to you, Daryl. Um, you have time to complete your presentation. We can start taking some questions if you want to still um, see if you can pause for a bit to share your screen um, and, and show your PowerPoint. I don't want you to feel like, you know, um, and Erica, you were breaking up so um, we can help out with um, looking at any questions in the queue. But we, hey, making an executive decision here. It's, we'll just get started. It's, 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 it's fine. It's yeah. fine. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's fine. Um, I think a lot of questions need to be, uh, be answered. And I mean, I pretty okay. much hit okay. all. I just want to extend that anyway. to you to be fair. Take it away. All, Take it away. really all good. It's storming my way here. Okay. So if somebody else wanted to go ahead, because um, my sound is probably going to keep coming in and out. Okay, right. we can hear you fine now. Yeah, we're natural people, so <laughs> it is one. All right. Um, so let's take some questions from the um, audience, I see Mr. Adam Powers, you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank everybody for just speaking. This was a wonderful panel. Um, really got a lot of great knowledge. I guess my main question is to Moses West. Um, I work in the solar industry and in the technology industry, and I'm very interested in the air to water generating machine. I'm trying to get a piece of land and put a little solar farm on. Uh, and I really wanted to know, you said it does work with solar panels. Um, how much energy does the smaller unit that you displayed uh, consume per day? Uh, the units are different. Uh, I can make them uh, 110, 220, single phase, 208, three phase, 460, three phase. So I can pretty much custom design it uh, to the specifications that you need. And then on energy consumption, say the big unit in um, uh, Puerto Rico that I was using, that guy was only taking 35 kilowatts, um, just, just nominal usage right there. Because once it gets started, you, get, you reach steady state operation. 
when you have a compressor, it takes a, it takes a bit of a it takes a bit of a kick to get it started, depending on how big it is. And that's your end rush, but uh, using capacitors to get that fast that point, um, it just it it just varies. The energy consumption truly varies on the on the design that you want. But what I can do now is I can actually tailor that design, so it I can even make a system now that's 220 single phase that could possibly make as much water as a system that is. You know, 463 phase by right. by the by the increasing of non-mechanical parts. It's just work that we've been doing to to make this technology even uh, more feasible. Uh, Adam, we can we actually have a unit, Adam, that we sell that takes about four kilowatts of energy um, per hour. I mean, it's perfect for especially if you have a solar or wind or using any other sort of um, alternative energy. And under most ideal working conditions, which is a nice humid day especially, um, the machine can probably generate about 500 liters in a day. Um, they are, they are it, it, again, it all depends on what, how much you need, how much you're going to be required to be using throughout the day. Um, they can be various configurations of some of the units that we have but we have standard units that work from you know the the, the smallest unit uses about two kilowatts um of electricity um per hour to 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 generate stuff uh, like i said we have a small one even in our office that generates water for everybody's drinking purposes every day thank you Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one last question, Mr. PJ. I'll leave you with the last question from the audience. And then I'd uh, like if each panelist would just take 30 seconds to give us the walk away nugget, the drop of water that you want us to take back with us to refill our own personal reservoirs so that we may continue to do this work. Good. Did you say I can, um, it's Miss PJ. Um, I wanted to know from Mr. Um, Robinson, um, you said that your, um, your, your understanding of the silver experiment was handled and it's going to be used in other countries. Um, is it being used in Malawi because they're ag country and I'm concerned at cleaning water in places that are really heavy ag, ag, um, driven like that country is that's what they sell agriculture and not having palatable water or good water or drinking water um is important mm -hmm. um great very great 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 question um currently um we're still trying to finish up the patenting and i guess the licensing process um but yes our silver nanoparticles and the filter device um can be used in malawi, malawi or for agricultural um, purposes uh, as well. So I'll have to talk to uh, to the rest of the team, but we'd be happy to uh, work work with you and definitely learn uh, learn more about it as well too. So I hope that answers your question. Hey, Daryl. Yeah. Yes. Hey, um, the on the on my large systems, I actually uh, impregnate the carbon with uh, silver, mm -hmm. and it actually impedes the uh, growth of bacteria within the. Uh, the filtration system as it sits there it, uh, for a long mm -hmm. period of time, like, you know, standing. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's, it's worked extremely well. We've, uh, we've aced every water quality test that we've had so far with that silver impregnation. Well, that's, that's great to know. That's great to know. That's actually something that um, um, my uh, associate has been working on a lot very for a few years. So that's very good to know um, that's, that's also working on a device such as yours. So we're on the right track. <laughs> Okay, so okay. I, I hate to, we are at time and I know we are trying to stay as punctual as possible. I'm not quite sure if there is the opportunity to allow each panel. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Let's go okay. ahead and start with yes. Daryl, please, for some closing thoughts. Marie. Thank you. Um, 
Sure, sure. Uh, closing thoughts. Um, there's a lot of materials out there, um, both natural and I guess artificial be man-made that can, that can uh, preserve water. Silver is just one of them. Um, a lot of plants, cilantro uh, as well, um, Rick, can be yeah. to purify, purify water um, as well too. So use what God gave you um, in your environment and you will find a solution. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Any other closing points from other panelists, please? Yeah, I, I would just like to say, um, take back your power. Uh, stop buying water. That water is being stolen from uh, the commons uh, and indigenous people all around the world repackaged at a profit and producing just untold pollution around the planet. Um, uh, organize yourselves and push back against um, privatization of water and make sure that you are working um, across uh, all, all the lines of, of state and legislative uh, districts um, to make sure that you exert the power that you have. If you have it, use it. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to say, just um, building on uh, what Naomi said, is that um, we are actually, you know, at war um, in terms of trying to, uh, across uh, the U.S., Black folk across the U.S. And the, and the whole African diaspora are really, you know, fighting a war of, of ideologies, of eco-philosophies, of worldviews about what human uh, and nature relationship should be. Um, the, the idea of the um, reduction or the, the decline of the ideology of commons, you know, has led us to the water uh, and environmental justice movements that we have. You know, our work is building on this legacy of struggle that has been going on for some time uh, where the, the human built environment that we're in is under, you know, highly contested, um, is in a highly contested state in terms of, of what those arrangements uh, should be, what our human and built environment uh, should be. Um, so I think um, one of the things that we need to, to, to pay attention to, you know, Flint gets the headline, uh, Detroit and other areas, Baltimore and Chicago is having its issues but they are, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has um, exacerbated um, the issue in many ways in terms of the structural racism and discrimination that exists in this society in general in the US, but also when it comes to looking at the access to resources along with, you know, um, services, social services that people need just to stay alive, including health care. So I think if we, um, the need for us to organize at the community level, and either we are participating in existing structures of power and water governance that exist, you know, who's on the water boards, who's making the decisions about who gets water, when, where, how, and at what price, do you know that? If you don't know that, you need to know. Um, but I think also we don't need to sit around and wait uh, for, for people who don't have our interest in the interest of our communities, you know, uppermost to, to take these decisions around water. So having to come up with this, the technologies that we heard about today is, is fine. Um, but right now, uh, the majority of people get their water through public water systems, right, through public utility. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we um, take that on, take this issue on as we look for our alternative solutions and our ways to have water sovereignty. Thanks. I, 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 like, that, I like that term that you use, water sovereignty. You know? Like I say, we, we in the Caribbean, um, we, yeah. and in Jamaica in particular, we, we may not realize how much blessed we are with the water and the issues um, our governments actually have been, and we have people of color fighting to get our water. You know, unfortunately, you know, the economics of a small island sometimes prevent that. 
Um, Excuse me. We, you know what? I actually thought you were going to say that you were competing, that, that households would, were competing with hotels and the, you know, no, tourists. Because there is too, actually, we, we have enough water. water. <laughs> there is, no, but the truth is that that's not true. We have enough water. We have what we have. And, and for systems like mine that are okay, newer technologies that are cleaning the water, we have access to a lot of potable water. The, the, the problem we have is the pollution of water bottles and, and people drinking water bottles and throwing it into the streams. The but sanitation. Jamaica is blessed. Yeah. yeah, man, sanitation issues. Yeah. So this is why, you know, like even our units, that, you know, we, 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 we try to get them into to offices because people won't be bringing bottled water to office. They can go to office and fill up with water every day. I mean, we have emergency units that, that run on a 30 kilowatt generator that go in a 20 foot container that can fit somewhere and, and generate almost um, 900 gallons of drinking water a day. I mean, there, there, there's things that we can do to change our thing. Our, our, our situation. What you are speaking about is very key. And this is something where water awareness, what you drink, what goes into your system, how the water is processed, how is it clean? Is the municipality living up to its regulations? I mean, we have water regulations that we have to fight for. And, 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 and we, we stand by how the water is discharged. You know, those water discharge regulations, people like myself um, sit on various boards just to make sure that those regulations are enforced and that we we keep our free and clean water i mean i give thanks because we're you know we have our our, our municipalities are different but like i said 90 percent of our water in jamaica is provided by a municipality so you know the extra pieces that come on you know people put filters in your in your in your house but if you you can't afford to change filters you know so basic water needs is very key even more than light um and anything else you know everything Absolutely. else starts with water it's life water so, is life yeah, that's, that's right that's, that's and, nature's gonna do her part too really quickly um uh mr west i think you're the last one just a closing remark and then let's just definitely keep the conversation going in the hoover and um i'm sorry to cut you um erica moderation but oh, you doing? Very much. what i what i look at is there's like i always say there's three sources of water liquid solid and a gas and uh, there's lots of technologies in the world that do remove water from the atmosphere in small small units middle sized units and large units uh but the units that uh, we work on now and research in the united the, here on the mainland of the united states are systems that are large enough to supply an entire municipality with water. We've, we've moved from just the box, move the technology from just the box that you can move around, tow around, sit in the building, sit behind the building. We've moved to the place where you can make an entire structure, a water generator. So that we're talking municipal water uh, for an area. We've done all the regulatory work here and that's the direction where we should go to start looking at the atmosphere as a viable source of water that is commercially viable in commercial quantities and not just the box. I build a box as well and and the military uses it quite regularly and so do municipalities. But the atmosphere is a source of water that we shall use and tap into. Well, we want you here in Chicago and I'll be in touch with you lickety split because we are looking at the walkable village where all of these things are self-sustaining and our net zero home, off-grid home. We're coming for you, brother. Oh, I, 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 got, I, I got the design for you. <laughs> okay. I got it. My sister, my sister don't, don't forget in your quest for water, you need to also think about the wastewater. So in your wastewater treatment and your is very Absolutely. important. I, I want to review our technology with you. I want to so review our technology with you. Yeah. Those, we do those, water sanitation, those, water and sanitation yeah. together. They go together. Very, they go together. Yeah, they have to go together. Amen. Beautiful. Yeah. So thank to all you. of the panelists, I say thank you. Thank you to the oh. participants for sticking with us through and um, being able to um, just hear this conversation. This is so such a very important topic of this time um, and of, of this moment because 
we are part of this living system and water is essential to our existence. So thank you all for joining us. Please feel free to continue to add, place your questions in the Hoover app. They will be answered. As you see, the answers are being populated by the panelists. So if you have a burning question that we weren't able to get to, please post it in Hoover and we will follow up. And thank you all again for such a wonderful panel. And um, thank you, Dr. Holmes. Thank you.